How you gonna eat fried worms? How you gonna eat fried worms? Ketchup, mustard, horseradish, cheese. Mmm. Fry me up another one, if you please. Reading books! Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Matt from the McCracken County Public Library in Paducah, Kentucky. With permission of Scholastic Books, I'm back again for the second part of our reading from How to Eat Fried Worms by Thomas Rockwell, featuring illustrations by Emily McCulley. Did you know that How to Eat Fried Worms has sold more than 3 million copies? Which means, if you line them up end to end, they would reach from Paducah, Kentucky to Kansas City, Kansas. Now, as a recap, we left off our first reading as Billy had just finished his first worm. It was easy enough. He even had a little fun with the rest of the guys. But he still has 14 worms left. With Tom's help, will Billy be able to do it? Will Alan and Joe be able to stop him? Well, tune in now to listen to chapters 5 through 10 of How to Eat Fried Worms by Thomas Rockwell. Chapter 5, The Gathering Storm. Alan and Joe stopped in the orchard by the pile of fresh dirt. You think he'll be able to do it? asked Alan, biting his thumbnail. I don't know, said Joe. He can't do it, said Alan. How could anybody eat fifteen worms? My father'll kill me. Fifty dollars! He ate that one awful easy. Forget it, said Joe. If he doesn't give up himself, I'll figure something out. We could spike the next worm with pepper. He'd eat one piece and then another, talking to Tom, then all of a sudden he'd sneeze, ka -chum! Then he'd sneeze again, ka -chum! Then again, ka -chum, ka -chum! A faint look of panic would creep over his face. He's beginning to wonder if he'll ever stop. He clutches his stomach, his eyes begin to water, ka -chum, ka -chum! Billy's awful stubborn, said Alan. Even if it was killing him, he might not give up. <laughs> Ka-chum! Ka-chum! cried Joe. He falls to the floor. I bend over him. God, I say, call his mother. It's the troglodo crisis. His eyes bleed up at me. Ka-chum! Remember that business last summer, said Alan, gnawing on his thumbnail, when it was 95 degrees in the shade and I dared him to put on all his winter clothes and his father's raccoon coat and his ski boots and walk up and down Main Street all afternoon? Ka-chum! Ka-chum! They went off through the orchard, Joe sneezing, sighing, rolling his eyes, pretending to be Billy suffering from a dose of peppered worm, Alan moaning to himself about how stubborn Billy could be. Fifty dollars? Chapter 6 The Second Worm Billy sighed. <sighs> On the plate before him lay the last bite of worm under a daub of ketchup and mustard. What's the matter? asked Tom. I don't know, sighed Billy. He picked up the fork again. Does it taste bad? No, said Billy wearily. I just taste ketchup and mustard mostly, but it makes me feel sort of sick, even before I eat it, just thinking about it. He sighed again and then glanced at Joe and Alan, talking to each other in whispers over by the window. What are you whispering about? Nothing. Then what are you whispering for? Nothing. It's not important. Just something Joe's father told him last night. What? Come on, finish up. It was nothing. We'll miss the cartoons. Billy shut his eyes and popped the last piece of worm into his mouth. Chewed. Gagged. Clapped his hands over his mouth. Gulped. Gulped. Toppled backward off the orange crate. Sprawling on his back and the chaff, he gazed peacefully up at the ceiling. Joe and Alan stood over him. Open up! Billy opened his mouth. Wider! See any Joe? Nah, he swallowed it. Okay, let's go. Chapter 7 Red Crash Helmets and White Jumpsuits After the movies, Tom walked home with Billy. Tomorrow I'll roll the crawler in cornmeal and fry it, like a trout. It's not really the taste, said Billy. It's more the thought. When I start to eat it, even though it's smothered in ketchup and mustard and grated cheese, I can't stop thinking worm. Worm, 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 worm. Gaggles of worms in bait boxes. Drowned worms drying up on sidewalks. A worm squirming as the fish hook gores into him. 
the soggy end of a worm draggling out of a dead fish's mouth, robins yanking worms out of the lawn, I can't stop thinking worm. Yeah, but I'll frighten cornmeal and it won't look like a crawler, said Tom. I'll put parsley around it and some slices of lemon, and then you can concentrate. Think fish. All the time you're waiting in the barn, all the time you're eating it, keep saying to yourself, Fish, 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 fish. Here I am eating fish. Good fish. Trout, salmon, flounder perch. I'll ride my mini bike into church. Dace, tuna, haddock, trout. Where do you hear the minister shout? Fish, 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 fish. Fish, 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 fish. Shark, haddock, sucker, eel. I'll race my father in his automobile. Eel, flounder, bluegill shark, will race all day till after dark. Billy cheered up. Think how they'd all stare. I'd rev up the aisle, zip around the front pews, down a side aisle under the stained glass windows. My parents would kill me. Reverend Yarder'd peer down over the Bible stand. William, he'd cry. William, you take that engine thing out of here this minute. Yeah, and then they'd come chasing out after us, said Tom. Billy laughed, waving their arms and yelling, and we'd lead them zigzag round and round and in and out among the gravestones and monuments in the cemetery, and then roar off down the Sandgate Road, leaving them draped over tombs panting and shaking their fists. Hup, hup, yelled Tom, dancing around and boxing the air. And that Monday, we'd smuggle it into class, disguised as Raymond Dooley because he's so fat, and hide it in the coat closet. And then when Millie Butler said anything, anything at all, even something like, excuse me, or if she even sniffed, we'd dump a whole bottle of ink over her head and run for the coat closet, overturning chairs and desks behind us to slow up Mrs. Howard. She'd come after us fuming and shouting threats, and suddenly the doors of the coat closet would slam open, and out we'd roar in our mini bike and blood-red crash helmets and white jumpsuits, our scarves streaming out behind us, and we'd roar round and round the classroom while Mrs. Howard knelt among the overturned desks and chairs, sobbing helplessly into her hands, and then rum rum out the door and up the hall, thumbing our noses at the monitors, brackety 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 up the stairs, stiff-arming tacklers into Mr. Simmons' office, up onto his desk, broom broom! A backfire into his face and zoom out the window as he topples backwards in his chair in a hurricane of quiz papers and report cards. And then crunch, landing on the driveway, we roar off down the highway to Bennington and join the Navy so Mrs. Howard and Mr. Simmons and our parents can't punish us. Chapter 8 The Third Worm Tom ran out of the kitchen at Billy's house, holding the sizzling frying pan out in front of him with both hands, the screen door banging behind him. Alan threw open the barn door when he saw them coming. Tom thumped the frying pan down in the orange crate. There, he said breathlessly, done to a tea. Look at her all golden brown and sizzling. It looks good enough to eat. Yeah, said Billy. He poked the worm with his fork. Tom took off the potholder glove he was wearing. Think fish, he said. Remember, think fish. Trout, salmon, found a perch. I'll ride my mini bike into church. Eel, salmon, bluegill, trout. Where do you hear the minister shout? Clam, flounder, tuna, sucker. Look out, here comes Mrs. Tucker. Lobster, black bass, oyster stew. There goes New Orleans, here comes Peru. He leaned over Billy and whispered in his ear, Fish, 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 go on, take a bite. Fish, 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 okay, second bite. Fish, 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 fish. Chapter 9. The Plotters Geez, you think it'll work? said Alan to Joe. Suppose it doesn't. He didn't seem to pay much attention today. Don't worry, said Joe. We got him thinking. It takes time. I got it all doped out. Trust me. Chapter 10. The Fourth Worm Billy ate steadily, grimacing, rubbing his nose, spreading on more horseradish sauce. Tom bent over him, hissing in his ear. Fish, 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 fish. Billy paused, watching Alan and Joe whispering by the door. He swished the last bite round and round in the ketchup and mustard. All of a sudden, he said, That's not fair. 
They can't act like that anymore. Every time I swallow, they lean forward as if they expected me to keel over or something. And then when I don't, they look surprised and shrug their shoulders and nudge each other. Come on, said Joe. Cut it out. We can watch you for cripe's sake. We're just standing over here by the window watching you. No, you're not, said Billy. You're whispering and acting as if you expected something to happen every time I swallow. It's nothing, said Joe. Forget it. Look, we'll turn around and look out the window while you swallow. What do you mean it's nothing, said Billy. What's nothing? Ah, come on, said Alan. It's just something Joe's father told him the other night. It's nothing. What? What? It'll just worry you, said Alan. It's crazy. It's nothing. Forget it. Billy tore the napkin away from his throat. Tell me. It's nothing, said Joe. You know how my father is. He's always yelling about something. Tell me or it's all off. Well, look, it's nothing. But the night before last, I was telling Janie about you eating the worms, and my father was on the porch and heard us. So he threw down his newspaper and says, Joseph. So I says, yes, Pa. And he says, have you had a worm, Joseph? And then he grabbed my shoulders and shook me till my hands danced at the ends of my arms like puppets. It's for your own good, he says. So I stuttered out, It's not going to do me any good if I shake to pieces, is it? Janie was wailing, and my mother was chewing her apron in the doorway. Alfred, she cries, what's he done? You'll decorate him. Has he hauled down the American flag at school and eaten it again? Has he? So what's the point? yelled Billy. Get to the point. What's it all have to do with me? I'm coming to it, said Joe, wiping his nose, but I wanted to show you how important it was my father nearly killing me and all. He sneezed, and then Alan began to sneeze and finally had to hobble off one of the horse stalls, hugging his stomach to recover. Anyway, said Joe, wiping his nose again and hitching up his Levi's, so my father told my mother he thought I'd eaten a worm. A what? says my mother, dropping her apron and clutching the sides of her head. A worm, says my father, nodding solemnly. So my mother fainted, collapsed, all helter-skelter right there in the doorway, and lay still, her tongue lolling out of her mouth, her red hair spread beautifully out the door sill. So I, get to the point, Billy yelled. Will you cut it out? Who cares about your mother? What does it have to do with me? I think he's lying, said Tom. Who ever heard of someone's mother fainting and her tongue hanging out? All right, yelled Joe apoplectically, stamping around. All right, now I won't tell. You can die, Billy Forrester, and you'll have to carry him home, Tom Grout, all by yourself. Nobody says to me, who cares about your mother? All right, I'm going. Alan, he yelled, they're insulting my mother, I'm going. Don't said Alan, running out of the horse stall and grabbing Joe by the shirt tail. Don't! You got to tell him! Even your mother'd say so! Mine too! No matter what he said! Ain't in a matter of life and death! I won't! said Joe, starting toward the door. Alan pulled him back. You got to! How long have we known poor Bill? Six, seven years? For all time's sake, Joe, because we were all once in kindergarten together, Think of the agony he'll face, Joe, the pain and the blood and the gore. Billy was on his knees by the orange crate, wringing his hands, not daring to interfere. But when Joe glanced sullenly back at him, he whispered, Please, Joe, for old time's sake. Well, will you apologize for insulting my mother? I do, said Billy. I do, I apologize. So Alan and Joe began to sneeze again, and this time had to bend over and put their heads between their legs to recover. Tom, who had been watching them suspiciously, trying to make out what was going on, started to say something. Shut up, hissed Billy fiercely, turning on him. You keep out of it. So Joe went on with the story, how his mother had been carried upstairs to her room, how the doctor had come shaking his head, how his aunt had sobbed, pulling down all the shades in their house, how that morning his mother had finally come downstairs for the first time, leaning on his aunt's arm, pale and sorrowful, how, yeah, said Tom, sure, so why, what does eating worms do to you? 
Nobody will tell me, said Joe, opening his eyes wide. It's been three days now, and nobody will say. It's just like the time my cousin Lucy got caught in the back seat of her father's Chevrolet with the encyclopedia salesman. Nobody will tell me why there was such an uproar, he wiped his mouth. But one thing's sure, it's worse than poison, probably. Crap, said Tom. Oh, yeah, said Joe. But then he and Alan had another sneezing fit, sprawling helplessly against each other. Look at them, said Tom to Billy. They're not sneezing, they're laughing. Come on, eat the last piece and let's get out of here. You really think so? said Billy doubtfully. The sneezing did look an awful lot like giggling. Sure, look at them. Tom gave Alan and Joe a shove. They collapsed in a heap, sneezing uncontrollably. Billy watched them. Yeah, sure, they weren't sneezing, they were laughing. Weren't they? Hay fever, gasped Alan. Hay fever! Aw, oh, you never had hay fever before, said Tom. How about yesterday or the day before? Come on, Billy, open up. So Billy, half believing Tom and half not, glancing doubtfully at Alan and Joe, allowed Tom to poke the last bite of worm into his mouth and led him out of the barn. Alan and Joe sat up. It didn't work, said Alan. Joe began to brush the chaff out of his hair. You wait, he wasn't sure. Tom was, but he isn't eating the worms. You wait, Billy's worried, he was before. That's why he said he felt like he was going to throw up. But now he's really worried. Suppose I wasn't lying. Did you see his face when I said my father shook me? I thought his eyes would bug right out of his head. Alan laughed. Oh, geez, yeah. And when you said your mother fainted? Joe stopped brushing the chaff out of his hair. Except why'd you laugh so much, for cripe's sake? If you'd kept a straight face, even Tom wouldn't have guessed. Ah, oh, you laughed first. What do you mean? Me? I laughed first. I did not. You did so. You laughed when you yelled at him the first time. You wiped your nose. And they went off through the meadow, arguing. <laughs>